Welcome to our next video in the series on condensed matter theory. In this video, I want to talk about topological phases of matter. And we will start by defining what we actually mean with topology and then see how this relates to materials and how we have been describing materials um, using quantum mechanics uh, and wave functions for the states of matter that we have. And then I will give an example of a one-dimensional system using a tight binding model and see how we can define the topology of those states. When we talk about topology, we talk about the study of properties of geometrical objects that are conserved under continuous deformations. So two objects might be different, but if you can continuously move from the uh, one object to the other, we call them to have the same topology. So if we take, for example, an apple, then this is almost a sphere. Of course, it has some dents. It's not a perfect um, sphere. And we look at the shape or the surface of an orange. Then if we compare now apple and oranges, they have the same topology. A different topology is that of a donut. A donut has a hole. You can continuously deform these objects to slightly change their form, but punching a hole into this sphere is not something you can do um, gradually. You either punch a hole or you don't. So the donut is of a different topology than the apple and the orange. Now, that's all nice and beautiful. But of course, the question that then emerges is, what does this have to do with the states of matter? So how can we relate this to matter? And for that, we're going to have a look at the wave function of a state of matter. And let's assume that we have a single occupied band. So we talk about an insulator and our wave function is given by a product over all k vectors in the Brillouin zone, where we create a block state with a certain wave factor and certain quantum numbers tau of k. If we look at our block state that we can create out of the vacuum, then this operator can be written on a basis where we create then our basis states. Again, block waves, but now of a certain local character. For example, if we have S and P orbitals in our basis, then I would be an element uh, of S, Px, Py and Pz. And we have n basis functions in general. For the example here, we would have n equal to 4. Now, if we look at our block states, then k is periodic in the reciprocal unit cell. And tau of k can be thought of as an n-dimensional vector. And in total, our wave function is just given as an n-dimensional complex vector on a periodic surface. For one-dimensional, that would be a ring. For two-dimensional, it's a surface periodic in two dimensions, which is the surface of a donut. And for three dimensions, you have a three dimensional periodic structure. Now, this vector on a ring or on a surface that is periodic can have different topologies. And with that, we can distinguish different phases of matter by the topology of the wave function as an n-dimensional complex vector in a Hilbert space for the different k-points on a periodic 
ring, surface or volume, depending if we have a one, two or three dimensional system. Now let's have a look at an example. And the example that we're going to take is a one dimensional tight binding model with two basis functions, for example, S and PZ. And we're going to assume that our vector is real. So alpha i, element r, and not element c, our expansion coefficients. So in this case, we have a real vector in two dimensions as a function of one third dimension. So our creation operator for the block state is given by alpha 1, a dagger k creating state 1, which could be the s for example, plus alpha 2, a dagger k state 2, which could be the pz orbital. And of course, our wave functions have to be normalized such that the norm of the vector is 1. And the vector that we look at is just given by the components alpha 1, alpha 2. Now, if you want to visualize, our problem is small enough that we can visualize, although I do have to make plots in three dimensions. We have alpha 1, alpha 2 on two different axes. And then we have the crystal momentum on the third axis going from 0 to 2 pi over a. And then your periodic, so this point comes back to the first. If we have a um, very simple vector, that would be just a constant, minus 1, 0. Then what we are looking at is a vector that is parallel for all k vectors. Now we can be a bit more creative. If we say that our vector alpha 1, alpha 2 is proportional to minus 1 sinus ka. It's proportional because I didn't normalize. Then we have our 2 pi over a and our alpha 1, alpha 2. Our vector starts and ends again in the minus 1 direction and then it has an oscillation on top. such that it wobbles up and down as a function of your crystal momentum. Now having a constant vector or having a vector that wobbles up or down definitely defines a different state, a different wave function, but you can this wobbling continuously move out. You can continuously make this smaller and smaller such that these two states have the same topology. These vector fields have the same topology. We can also define a state with a different topology, alpha 1, alpha 2. If we take alpha 1, alpha 2 equal to minus cosine k a sine k a, then our vector representing the wave function rotates as a function of crystal momentum. Such that, well, now as a function of crystal momentum, it rotates. You can already see that I can't do this with my hands anymore because well, there is a winding in there and you can't continuously by just making small changes to these angles, unwind this winding. You can well, 
flatten here, but then in the end you will be just flat and then close for the end of the brilliant zone. You have this quick winding around there. So this state is of a different topology than those two. This has no winding, this has a winding of one. Now instead of trying to draw three-dimensional pictures by hand, we can of course make some plots with a computer. And there on the top row we have states that all have the same topology. There is no winding in there. You can continuously change from one state to the other. In the bottom row, we have from left to right a state with a winding number of one, a winding number of minus one. You can either wind clockwise, wind counterclockwise, and then a state with winding number equal to two. You can rotate two times. And then, of course, you can wind three times, four times, five times, and they all have different topologies. Now, making such kind of plots is possible for a real vector on a two-dimensional Hilbert space. But when your Hilbert space becomes larger, and in the end we have very large Hilbert spaces to represent real materials, um, visualizing these kind of vector fields becomes near to impossible. So for that it is nice to define a topological invariant that can distinguish these different cases. And the topological invariant for the example that we made here is already something that we listed and that is the winding of this vector around the axis of crystal momentum. Either your vector wobbles but doesn't turn around, or your vector rotate once as a function of crystal momentum. It can rotate in the other direction, and it can rotate twice, three times, etc. So, as a topological invariant for this two-dimensional real Hilbert space with a one-dimensional brilliant zone, we could define the winding number as a topological invariant. You can make small changes to your wave function in a continuously in a continuous matter, but they will never change the winding number. So for our winding number, we can use that the cross product between two unit vectors is given by the angle between them times a unit vector perpendicular to it. So if I have A and B, then the cross product is a vector perpendicular to both of them. And if I now have two vectors with some small angle, then I can determine this angle by taking the cross product. Now in order to relate this to the vectors on a brilliant zone, we will take this to be the vector k, or the vector at crystal momentum k, and the next one the vector at the crystal momentum k plus delta k, and then we can of course sum over all those angles such that the winding number in the end is the limit of the number of states going to infinite, and then we sum over all small steps, and we want to have theta, so we take the arc sinus, and we have our wave function with two uh, as a vector in an Hilbert space of a two dimension. So we have alpha one at k times alpha two at k plus delta k minus alpha two at k times alpha one at k plus delta k giving you the cross product 
of the two vectors at k and k plus delta k. Well, k is then just given by n divided by capital N times 2 pi over a, and delta k is given as 1 over n times 2 pi over a. And alpha i 2 pi over a is equal to alpha i and 0. It's a periodic system and a periodic state. Now the winding number is nice because I can visualize it, but winding actually is not something that is invariant in more, or can you be used as a topological invariant in more than two dimensions. If you have three dimensions and your wave function is winding like this, so you have a three-dimensional Hilbert space, then you can always at each point in k-space move your vector in the third dimension such that your winding slowly goes from a circle into a cone into just something that always points in the same direction and from there you can actually then start to wind in the other direction so you can unwind your system. So the winding number is not a topological invariant if your Hilbert space is either complex or more than three-dimensional. What we can use as a topological invariant is the Berry phase. And the Berry phase is the phase that your wave function acquires when you adiabatically change your wave function from k to k prime, so you slowly move from one state to the other on a closed loop. And of course, we have a closed loop here in our Brillouin zone because we can just move in a straight line and come back to the point where we are. So we will define the Berry connection a of k as i times your wave function at k and then the derivative with respect to crystal momentum and then the Berry phase is then the integral minus pi over a to pi over a, you can also take the integral from zero to two pi over a of your Berry connection. If you do this by taking a tight binding model with n sides, such that you have a discrete system and then take the limit of n to infinite, you will find that e to the i times your Berry phase is given by the limit of well, the number of sides to infinite, the product that you acquire at each step that you make, and there we just have the overlap of the wave function at k and the wave function at k plus delta k. And we want to look at the phase, not at the change in norm that we have if you do this. So we divide by the norm of this overlap. Such that we're left with a pure phase. And again, the crystal momentum is quantized in n2 pi over a and delta k is 1 over n. 2 pi over a and the wave function at 2 pi over a is equal to the wave function at k equals 0. So this is a topological invariant that can be used also for higher dimensional or complex Hilbert spaces um, as well, you have here your vectors and you just look how your vector overlaps or how the phase is changing when you go from one state to the other. We now 
can distinguish between topological trivial and topological non-trivial states. If the Berry phase is zero, we will call the state topological trivial. If the Berry phase is non-zero, we will call the state topologically non-trivial. Now let's have a look at an example. And we're going to make a 1D model where we have a tight binding Hamiltonian. We will take a basis of S and PZ orbitals. And we will include nearest neighbor hopping. So from S to S gives you an hopping SS sigma. From PZ to PZ will give you an hopping PP sigma. Um, the first one negative, the second one positive. Between S and P, you have a hopping SP sigma. Uh, if you hop to the right, you have a hopping minus SP sigma when you hop to the left, such that you have a cosine like dispersion for the S and the P orbital, the S hole like the, uh, the S electron like the P hole like, and you have an interaction between them that scales with SP sigma or with the sinus of the interaction between them. We can now distinguish between even wave functions and odd wave functions. If either the S band or the P band is fully occupied, it's an even state. If at gamma and X, the uh, occupation is different. So either an S band occupied at gamma and a P band at X, or a P band occupied at gamma and an S band at X, the wave function is odd. And we find, if you calculate the Berry phase, that the even states have a winding number of zero and are topological non-trivial. The uh, topological trivial, the odd states, have a winding number of a half and a Berry phase of pi are topologically non-trivial. And as you can see, well, I also plotted the winding numbers below. You nicely see that you have these kind of windings in there if you just look at your vector. And that we have the topology in there that is then different between the trivial and the non-trivial case. Now, you might of course wonder why talk about topology um, we can always already distinguish these wave functions by the irreducible representation. One wave function is even, the other wave function is odd. So when you can distinguish them by how they behave under the symmetry operations, there's no need to look at the distinction between them as a function of topology. Um, that is true. But we can now remove the inversion symmetry from the Hamiltonian. And we can do that by taking the tight binding Hamiltonian that we had before and we add an interaction between the S and the P bands that doesn't depend on crystal momentum such that we no longer have inversion symmetry. And you can also see now that K and minus K are no longer at the same energy. So you truly distort um, that state. And actually you can make that even a large distortion. So we can no longer talk about even and odd states for our two dimensional Hilbert space. We can still talk about the winding number in a higher dimensional Hilbert space. The winding number is also not a good or a conserved quantum number anymore. It doesn't distinguish different topologies. But we can calculate the Berry phase for these different states. And you find that indeed you can still distinguish here the cases by uh, the uh, Berry phase and the Berry curvature. Um, and you find that although we're no longer in an odd wave function because you don't have inversion symmetry, 
you're still in a topological non-trivial state. So topology remains, whereas inverse you no longer remains. And indeed you have materials where you have no inversion symmetry, so you can't distinguish your, your states by even and odd, but you still can distinguish uh, states by the topology of the wave function. And then of course you can have phase transitions as a function of topology, where then the topology of the state can function as the order parameter in your system. In uh, our next video we will discuss what happens at the interface between a topological trivial and a topological non-trivial system. Um, you do not find really phase transitions as a function of temperature or pressure between topological trivial and non-trivial, but you can have uh, states where you find such kind of transitions as a function of space um, or as a function of magnetic field, which is the integer quantum Hall effect, where as a function of magnetic field you go through different topological representations of your wave function. So I hope to have shown you uh, how topology enters into the description of states in materials where our wave function is given as a vector on a complex Hilbert space as a function of crystal momentum and crystal momentum lives on a periodic uh, space either on a loop or on a donut in one or two dimensions or on the equivalent in three dimensions and these vector fields on these periodic surfaces can have different topologies and these topologies can be used to distinguish different states of matter. Thank you very much for your attention. Stay healthy. We see each other later.